This clear and colorless liquid here is ketamine. This is one of the most transformational medications that we use in the West that it can be absolutely revolutionary for depression, chronic pain, and so many other conditions. And it can be given IV in your muscle, intramuscular, what we call. It can be given as a nasal spray or orally under the tongue or next to the cheek. But despite how effective ketamine is, patients are purposely withheld information about which is the most effective way of getting ketamine to treat the underlying root causes of depression, anxiety, and so many other conditions. So you are going to learn which is the most effective way based on medical facts, what might be the most effective way for you or a loved one if you're struggling with depression or chronic pain or any of the other conditions I mentioned, and why doctors and nurses and Medical clinics purposely withhold this valuable information for patients in the operating room, in anesthesia and surgery, where ketamine was first developed as an anesthetic medication. You'll note that it was not given orally. Ketamine was not given as a spray. Ketamine was, and to this day still is, given primarily IV. And why is that? Did you, have you gotten ketamine IV in surgery or in a ketamine clinic? Let me know below. I really want to hear your experience so that you can also share with you others along your journey to help empower them. When, but when we want to give patients the most titrated specific dose of the medication in the safest way, we always give it IV in the operating room. And it's no surprise that IV ketamine is indeed the most powerful and effective way by nearly every study out there for addressing depression or chronic pain or other conditions as rapidly and as reproducibly as possible. Why is that? What does it look like? Actually, it's, we put this clear liquid, it actually says for IV, or it can be used as a muscular injection, which we'll talk about in a minute. And we put it in a syringe, we dilute it, and we connect it in this tubing into a patient's vein. That lets us titrate very specifically the amount of ketamine that a patient gets with 100% bioavailability. Bioavailability is the percentage of the medication that is going into your body that actually gets absorbed and reaches the target site of your body. So for example, when you take ketamine orally, about 30% of that, 10 to 30% will reach your brain and central nervous system where it has the antidepression, anti-suicidal ideation, chronic pain effects. IV ketamine is 100% bioavailable because every milligram of ketamine that goes into this tubing, that goes into your vein, will reach your brain by definition. That's how we define bioavailability. And every step you go from IV to intramuscular to intranasal spray to oral, you lose bioavailability because some of that ketamine has to be metabolized by the liver. And for other reasons is lost. For example, if you're spraying ketamine, you might spray a certain number of milligrams. Maybe you have a stuffy nose. It doesn't actually reach the blood vessels that will absorb that ketamine and take it to your brain. Maybe if you give it as a shot, it'll reach some scar tissue or some of it will squirt out in the other direction or some of it will not ultimately reach the target site, which is where it exerts its action, the antidepressive effects, et cetera. At least not in the most reproducible and uh, efficient way for looking for the effectiveness and the speed of onset. When you give any medication IV in the operating room or outside the operating room, when it reaches your IV, it reaches your brain within seconds. That is significantly faster than taking something orally or taking something in any other form. Once again, intranasal, intramuscular, etc. How about how you can adjust the dose. We have a saying in medicine that you can always give more, but you can't take anything out. When you deliver ketamine, for example, as a shot, which we do rarely in surgery, we put it in a syringe, usually a small syringe with a small needle, and we'll literally inject this into someone's deltoid area where there's a rich vascular bed, meaning a lot of blood vessels that will absorb that ketamine. But once you've given that ketamine, you can't take it out. You can't control how much you've given. The same goes for a tablet that you swallow or something you put under your tongue, what we call sublingual, or for that matter, a spray. IV is different because for the IV ketamine, when it's connected to this tubing, you're constantly getting a different amount if your doctor is titrating that ketamine to what 
your brain and body require. So you, if you give a little bit too much, you can lower literally the volume on that ketamine and within seconds, that effect will change versus the other forms where you don't have that same granularity. So the theme here that you can see is that in medicine, when we want the most effective, fastest treatment, like in life-saving situations here in the operating room, we use IVs, hands down. We do not use oral anesthesia unless it's a matter of convenience, which takes us to why any clinic would use oral or intramuscular or, in or intranasal. And as you can also tell, in an operating room, you need specialized doctors to deliver IV medications. The same goes for ketamine used outside the operating room for depression or anxiety. And if you want to give IV ketamine, you need to have a specialized doctor to do it. And if you are now recognizing that this all comes down to money at the end of the day, you are correct because it is much cheaper to give ketamine orally to give it intramuscularly or as a spray. You don't need the same level of monitoring with vitals monitors or an anesthesiologist or an emergency room doctor. Those are the two doctors that give IV ketamine the most, more than any other doctor. If you don't have that level of specialized doctor, you cannot safely give IV ketamine, even though it might be the most effective form of ketamine for that patient. The most effective form for you might not be IV. And you need to know that even though IV is the most effective to help treat a condition, not every patient needs that level of therapy. When a patient comes to me with severe depressive symptoms or severe chronic pain that has failed other antidepressants or pain medications, can't get up in the morning, severe suicidal ideation, maybe side effects from other medications have been horrendous, they might be a candidate for IV ketamine. But that's not every patient who's depressed. That's not every patient in chronic pain or with addiction or anxiety who's looking to find healing. You have to find the right treatment, of course, for the right patient. But unfortunately, in the San Francisco Bay Area where I practice, there are numerous providers that will push the type of ketamine that they are comfortable giving. And this is the problem when it comes down to patients not getting the care that they deserve, especially vulnerable patients who have been struggling for months or years to find healing from their underlying conditions. I had a patient recently who <laughs> showed a particular doctor's website. We're on their website. They ridiculed the medical model of IV ketamine. And guess what kind of doctor that was? It wasn't an anesthesiologist or emergency room doctor. It was someone who was not qualified to give IV ketamine and instead depended on oral ketamine and Unfortunately, that patient came to me so confused because they're like, well, this doctor says that IV ketamine is not the most effective. And I really had to have a frank discussion about there's a question there's a difference between the most effective form. Like I said, IV is always going to be the most safest and titratable dose of way of delivering ketamine. But just because someone can't give IV ketamine or because it's too expensive, you can't tell a patient that it's not the right form for them really breaks my heart that every day patients ask me these questions when they call. And it shows how unfortunately patients get taken advantage of. And it's always the most vulnerable patients that need this information and are withheld it because some doctors or some clinics or nurses don't feel comfortable with giving the most effective form of ketamine. So they resort to what they are comfortable with. The oral is obviously going to be cheaper and it's often effective for some patients. You need to know your patient and you need to know what is the right treatment for that patient. You can't just make fun of what, call, what they call a medical model, which sometimes happens. I will say IV ketamine can happen in sterile medical environments like this operating room. And that's not appropriate either. It has to be a caring, compassionate healing space because the environment influences what the ketamine does to your body, regardless of those forms. Now, one other really important thing that you need to know is that the dose of ketamine depends heavily on the patient that you're trying to treat. There are guidelines for every form of ketamine, whether it's intranasal or oral or intramuscular, et cetera. But I have learned over hundreds and hundreds of ketamine infusions that it is rarely, if ever, one dose that fits every patient. And I have found myself using doses of ketamine that vary drastically from the 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per hour, which is what typically people describe in the literature, 
up to more than double that, even more than double that sometimes, depending on various factors, especially if we're treating conditions like chronic pain that might require significantly higher doses. Once again, you can't give those doses with oral ketamine or with intramuscular ketamine or intranasal. You can only give those with the IV because those doses require such fine tuning to deliver the medication safely to your central nervous system that you can't just give a shot, a big whopping dose and walk away. It has to be constantly monitored safely and given in a compassionate way with one-to-one -one interaction with the patient if you want to do ketamine correctly. Like I said, lots of clinics out there, a lot of bad actors as well. So I hope that if you have ever heard of ketamine, you know, you know a little bit more to advocate for yourself. So as you do your research, you know what to look for, what form of ketamine might be right for you, and what questions to ask clinics, especially clinics that don't offer all of those forms of ketamine, and to ask them why they don't offer them. Because if you hear them saying that the IV form is overly medical, it's a sterile, not a compassionate way of delivering ketamine, you really need to ask who is the doctor saying that or who is a nurse saying that and why are they saying that? Because I've seen far too many patients suffer. I don't want you to be one of them. If you did appreciate everything that you learned today, do please hit that like button. Let me know below what else you want me to reveal for you in terms of the secrets of medicine, especially around ketamine and other psychedelics. If you learn something new, please share with others so that you can help them advocate for their health. And now I want to answer some of your questions. Thank you so much for all of your support. And always the Supercast is where you can sign up to keep up with all of our private Zooms where we can have more smaller group settings to answer your questions. We meet twice a month. The link is below. We're actually meeting this Sunday next to answer more of your questions about the secrets of medicine and just how much power you have over your health because it's probably more than you've ever been told. Straight Talk No Messing says, I will have to speak to someone who specializes in ketamine as my doctor didn't have much knowledge and I've been thinking of ketamine over pills. Very interesting point. Replacing antidepressants with ketamine is not appropriate. If we're talking about just replacing one pill with another pill, the idea is to use the fewest number of interventions of a medication like ketamine to achieve the longest lasting result. It's so important that patients don't simply replace one set of pills with something else because that might not be addressing the root cause of feeling stuck, being depressed, anxious, et cetera. Clonidine during ketamine for BP. Yes, D. Harris, we do give clonidine or labetalol or hydralazine during ketamine infusions. It depends on what we're trying to address. Is it there an element of anxiety and hypertension or is there something else? Morgan is on a quite a few mental health medications. Morgan, I'm wishing you the best for your healing. I hope that you learned something new. I'm not saying ketamine is right for everyone. You absolutely need to speak with your doctor, but, I want you to know what questions to ask, that you don't have to fall victim, victim to uninformed providers, especially in this realm of psychedelic medicine where there is so much misinformation and sometimes deliberate withholding of information. G glue. Why do they give ketamine for anesthesia from auto accidents? Sometimes they give ketamine in traumas because ketamine, unlike other medications, like the gases out of the ventilator behind me or propofol or other medications, does not lower blood pressure the way that other medications do. So if someone is coming from an auto accident, maybe where they've lost a lot of blood and they are already hypotensive or have low blood pressure, ketamine can be a, powerfully, a powerful medication to help someone go to sleep without tanking their cardiovascular status. Why can't I do ketamine while on Suboxone? Sherry, I've never, I've heard this. I've not seen a reason why I've given ketamine to many patients on Suboxone. The dose has to be titrated appropriately, meaning it has to be adjusted appropriately. Once again, that's where IV has advantages over other forms. Not saying other forms are not effective, but you have to pick the right form for the right patient. Hey, Nay, you're so welcome. Why can't I use ketamine to get off of Suboxone? Sherry, another good question. I have had patients through a collaborative care approach be able to come off of Suboxone. When we're addressing the root causes of why the Suboxone is needed, it can be for many reasons. I can't comment more without more information. How does it affect your memory? Candy Mitch, I've had patients come to me so depressed that their memory, it's almost, we call it pseudo dementia, where it's like they have dementia, but it's not because of Alzheimer's or because of Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's. It's, it might be because they are so depressed that their memory suffers. If we can treat the depression, whether with ketamine or with talk therapy or any other modality, their memory can improve. And I've seen this time and time again, it is incredible among some of the most transformational changes I've seen. My headaches 
are caused due to neck pain and shoulder pain. That's not uncommon. I'm so sorry that you have that. But when we can address the underlying pain in the shoulder area, perhaps the headaches can be treated. I've seen this as well many times, but it's not always with ketamine. It's not always with trigger points. It's not always with ibuprofen and other medications. It does depend on figuring out why that tension is there. It could be from any number of reasons and a good doctor will drill down to see why it's there in the first place. Addiction higher with nasal than IV? No, Heidi, it's, it's a very good question. I don't, I'm not aware of any data that suggests that one form has a higher abuse potential than another form, but using it in the wrong environment can have a higher risk of abuse potential. And we'll end with fibromyalgia. I have seen patients improve their pain when they suffer from fibromyalgia when they receive ketamine, but not all patients with fibromyalgia will respond to ketamine because fibromyalgia itself has so many different reasons. And just like it'd be inappropriate to say, take ibuprofen for someone with knee pain, you have to know why the knee pain is there. Same for fibromyalgia, why is the fibromyalgia there? I wouldn't say that ketamine is right for everyone, but I have seen it be, once again, transformational for some individuals with fibromyalgia. But that's where the art and science of medicine comes to play. And you never wanna just throw what you're comfortable with at somebody. You know, in medicine, I'll end with this. We have a saying that when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if everything looks like a nail and all you do is give ketamine, that's a scary proposition. If I'm a patient and I see a doctor that does that, I would be very, very careful to make sure, are they really taking into account my whole medical history and not just recommending the one thing that they do the most? whether it's a surgeon or an anesthesiologist or whoever it is. So I hope that you came out with more information. Um, hey, if you could hit that like button, share what you learned with others, subscribe to keep up with all my lives. Remember, I do actually have a healing center in San Francisco. The link to that is below as well. You can uh, either see me there if you're in California or join the Supercast for our private lives of Zoom to ask more personalized questions. I'm wishing you the best. And remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told.